conquerors. Even when we lose, we win. Hallelujah. Even when we lose, we win. More than conquerors. Romans chapter 8, verses 33 through 39. Those who are able stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And the King James text today reads, let me put it up there for you. I'm constantly forgetting to do that. There you go. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah, that's about the most wonderful passage of Scripture you can read, isn't it? In a nutshell, there ain't a thing in the world can get between you and the, the love of God. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me a moment? Father, once again, Lord, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful, mighty presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in the house of God today. Lord, the spirit of intercession is like a cleansing wave that washes over us. It purifies us and sanctifies us. For in your presence, O oh God, we bear our soul and we stand naked before you. And Lord, we make no claims today of our own holiness, our own righteousness, but rather we ask God that you would look upon us through the veil of the cross of Calvary. Lord, that you would see us today, not as we are, but as we will one day be. When the promise of God is realized and we are taken from this world and we stand before you in glory, purified, sanctified, holy, eternal, filled with nothing but the love and grace of God. Master, the word of God needs to go forth in power. It needs to go forth in love that the people of God might benefit from it. Lord, you placed a word in my heart for this moment, and I need your help to deliver it. Oh, Master, today anoint, touch, help. Give us strength in this dark hour. Give us hope when things seem hopeless, and be our help when all is helpless. Help us to leave this place, and help us, Lord, those that are watching by the Internet, help them, Lord, to leave this message feeling refreshed, encouraged, enlightened, and uplifted. If there be any today, God, who are yet unsaved, save them. If there are any today, God, in need of healing, then heal them. If there are any today, God, who need deliverance, set them free. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. I'm going to try to keep this succinct and don't want to use snicker. Not a one of you. Looking at the clock. Oh, yeah, Bill's got his lip. He's, he's buttoned his lip. Martin, eh, he, he's, hold, he's holding on pretty good. Are you working this afternoon? 
Hallelujah. We're going to take Martin out for his birthday today after church. We like to take folks for their birthday out to uh, Chubby's instead of Denny's because Denny's is our everyday place. So we like to go to Chubby's and it's my treat. So Martin's my, he's my treat today. That's how we do for birthdays. His birthday is this week. As a matter of fact, I believe it's tomorrow. He'll be 110. And so we want to celebrate with him. <laughs> I'm teasing. He's not that far ahead of me. That's the part that's scary. So if he was going to be 110, I'd be pretty old myself. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, we live in a world, we live in a church age that I never thought for a million years I would ever see. I never in a million years thought Martin, whoops, that's why that thing clicks, because I put my glasses on it, didn't I? I never dreamed I'd see the day when the church would be so embroiled in the affairs of this life, and so embroiled in politics, and so embroiled in social issues, and so embroiled in uh, these so-called uh, wars, you know, related to lifestyle and what have you. What do they call that? No, uh, something or other war. Culture, Culture war. war, yeah. I, I, I told you I'm getting old. We live in a day today where the church is constantly fighting. Constantly battling. I have never seen a time when God's church was so ugly and so detestable and so just mean-spirited and malicious Martin, this isn't what the church looked like when I was growing up. Not the church I grew up in. No, no, no. Uh -uh. It's not the way the church looked. This is the byproduct of the last 30 so years of a marriage. And I'm going to just say it plain today so folks, if you're offended, well, so be it. This is what happens when you marry politics with religion. This is the byproduct of the marriage between the religious right and the Republican Party. You get that negative... Ne See, I'm going to tell you a little secret about politics. Politics can't help but be dirty. You know, there's an old saying that politics makes strange, strange bedfellows. During the campaign of 2016, to hear Mitt Romney tell it, uh, you know, Mr. Trump was the biggest twin on the planet and he was going to blow up the earth and there was no way in the world he was qualified to be president. In other words, in 2016, Mitt had it right. Yes. To hear him tell it now, oh my goodness, Trump's the Messiah. He's ridden into town on the back of a donkey. No, he either had ridden in or he is the donkey. But anyhow, <laughs> he's ridden into town on the back of the donkey and oh, he's going to save the world and I don't see why he should have any trouble in 2020 getting reelected. You know, isn't it amazing how politicians can just change their story at the drop of a hat? All because they're, they're, they're jockeying for position. You know, they're trying to get something going on for themselves. And all of a sudden, the guy that yesterday was their biggest enemy to Today he's their best friend. Yeah. Politics is dirty business. Christians have no business in politics. That's right. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say it plain. Christians have no business in politics. Now, there are a lot of good people who have Christian values and have Christian faith, and they're in politics. And I believe with all my heart there are people who do everything in their power to do the best they can with what they've got, but they still, by, by, by nature of the beast, Martin, they still wind up having to, you know, do some pretty sticky stuff. They still wind up having to do some pretty ugly stuff. They still wind up having to compromise themselves at times in areas that maybe they wouldn't like to compromise themselves. Because that's the nature of politics. That's, that's how politics works. When you try to marry the church with the political world, honey, it is a recipe for disaster. Because the political can never be entirely religious. Right. You can't do it. Not in America. Not if you live up to the Constitution of the United States. People say, oh, we're a Christian country, baloney. You're so full of crap, you don't even know 
There are so many things in the Constitution that contradict Christian teaching. If we were a Christian nation, it would be declared in the Constitution of the United States of America that no other religion and no other God is welcome here. But it doesn't say that. It says here, you're free to worship any God you choose to worship. You're free to worship any way you choose to worship. You're free to believe any way you choose to believe. That is the teaching of Freemasonry, not Christianity. That completely and totally contradicts Christian teaching. Because Christian teaching says... Any form of idolatry whatsoever is forbidden. Am I telling the truth? Uh -huh. All right? So don't give me this garbage. This is a Christian nation. Furthermore, I've got news for you. Christian teaching is that you do not live by the sword because if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. So the notion that everybody in town should have a gun and everybody should be able to carry all kinds of assault weapons and be able to arm themselves. Honey, that is not consistent with Christian teaching. That's right. Oh, but when you marry the Republicans with the religious, all of a sudden you go to church and they're up there preaching and dancing about how everybody in the church ought to have a gun and everybody in the church should be ready. My God. See, there's an interesting thing about marriage between the church and, and uh, politics. Religion can affect politics generally in a very negative way by the time it's all said and done. But politics can destroy religion. So when you married those two things, do you know what happened? The politics got religious to some degree, but the religious got political to an, un an outrageous degree. Yep. All of a sudden, that which ought to be spiritual is no longer spiritual. Now, that which ought to be spiritual is entirely carnal. It is entirely 100% political. It is obsessed with all things earthly, all things worldly, all things carnal. Am I telling the truth today? Yep. I'm going to tell you a little secret. God's church is going to pay an enormous price for religious fundamentalist and evangelical support of Donald J. Trump. And do you know what that price is? Souls. Millions of people are going to wind up away from God for eternity because of the church allowing itself to become embroiled in politics, seeking worldly political influence and power, rather than staying on its spiritual mission. The integrity, the moral authority of the church is gone. It's gone. The minute you got behind this demon, and claim that, oh, bless God, we're behind this guy 100%. Oh, this is God's man, blah, blah, blah. The minute you did that, all your moral authority went out the window. And there are people now who see the church in such a negative light that they will never, ever hear and believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ because of your stupidity. And I'm going to tell you something, preacher. I'm going to tell you something, First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. I'm going to tell you something, pastor. I wouldn't want to be you in the judgment for a million trillion dollars. I wouldn't want to be Franklin Graham in the judgment before God for a billion dollars. You couldn't pay me enough money to trade places with these traitors to the faith who have given up all moral authority, who have given up all spiritual authority because they were more interested in winning culture wars. They were more interested in winning political wars. You see, we got people in the church today, Lisa, who believe that, well, if we don't overturn Roe versus Wade, then the church has lost. We lost that battle.
battle. When Roe versus Wade came down, all God's church lost the battle. You idiot. You idiot. That was not the church's battle. It never has been the church's battle. It never will be the church's battle. Any issue of right and wrong, any issue of holy versus unholy, any issue of godly versus ungodly is God's battle. And God said, you shall not need to fight in this battle, for the battle is not yours, but mine. If the church would have gone to its knees, then abortion, legal or not, could be virtually wiped out in America if the church would have stayed on its mission, if the church would have kept preaching the cross, if the church would have stayed in a spiritual vein instead of getting into the political vein. Guess what? We could have had it, uh, Lisa, so that very few abortions were occurring regardless of whether it's legal or not. You follow what I'm saying? You see, you don't have to win a battle in this world. You don't have to win a battle in the eyes and in the sight of men to be winners. You don't have to win in the sight of the world to be a conqueror. The Word of God tells us today in our primary text that we are more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. We don't just conquer. We more than conquer. If anybody on this planet understood the idea of a conqueror, it was Paul the Apostle. He lived in a world where Rome ruled the majority of the known world. Most of the countries that Paul was familiar with, most of the, the countries that Paul traveled through had all been conquered by Rome. They had all been conquered by Herod and Pilate. They had all been conquered by the Caesars. They were all under the authority and the control of a foreign entity and a foreign power. And yet... Paul could still say, we are more than conquerors. We're more than the Caesars. Hallelujah. We're more than the Pharaohs. We're more than the dictators. We're more than these people who have conquered nations. We are more than conquerors through Christ. He said, we've won battles that Caesar never wins. We can win battles that Pharaoh can't never win. Hallelujah. Honey, I can win the battle that would send my soul to a devil's hell and put me on track for God's great heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. Oh, if you're focused on the right things, if you stay on a spiritual track, you will be more than a conqueror. The wonderful thing about God is as more than a conqueror, Johnny, even when you lose, <laughs> you win. See, that's the thing about being more than a conqueror. A conqueror is not only a conqueror so long as he wins. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. When the Caesars moved into Palestine with the armies of Rome... The only way he was going to be called a conqueror is if he won the fight. And he was able to subjectify and to subdue the people of Palestine, which of course he did, and therefore he was branded a conqueror. But in Christ Jesus, we don't even have to win to win. Oh my God. We don't have to be so strong that we can overcome the other guy and we still win. Oh, I hope you're hearing me today. This is exciting. The Bible said God has declared that His grace is made perfect in weakness. He said, even when you lose, you win. <laughs> even when you're so weak, 
that sin overtakes you, my grace is there, you win. Even when the devil thinks he's got you because, Martin, you had such a lousy day, you acted like a fool and made a complete. I'm not picking on you for any reason except you're the first person come into my line of sight. Everybody in the church looking at him like, aha, the pastor's prophetically picking him out. No. <laughs> Even when I, let me, let me put it on me. I, I don't want to put it on Mark. Even when I have such a bad day that I cuss and carry on and act the fool and get all upset and angry. And, and guess what? God's grace is still there for me. And even though the devil thought he won the day, honey, he lost the war. Hallelujah. Because I'm still saved. I'm still headed for heaven. I'm still on my way to glory. The devil can't win the battle if he wants to. Because when the grace of God is present, even in weakness is his strength made perfect. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors. Even when we lose, <laughs> we win. Oh, church, don't you realize if you'd have stayed on point and stayed on mission when Roe versus Wade was passed, you could have been more than a conqueror. Yeah. Even though it looked like we lost, even though it looked like you lost, you could have won. You could have still won the battle. But instead, you were fighting the wrong enemy, you were fighting the wrong war, you were focused on the wrong thing, and when it appeared you lost in this life, in this world, you completely lost sight of everything spiritual. And you married yourself to a political party in an effort to win in this world. And then when Donald J. Trump come along, oh, guess what? He's going to help us to win! Oh, he's going to make us the victor in the culture war. He's going to help us to demonize and make an enemy of abortion. He's going to help us to demonize and make an enemy of the immigrant. He's going to help us to demonize and make an enemy of those queer folks that we don't like. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Even when you think you're winning, you lose. See, everything in the spirit realm works about opposite to everything in the natural realm. In the spirit realm, when it looks like you're losing in the natural, you're actually winning. In the spirit realm, when it looks like you're winning in the natural world, you're actually losing. You remember what I said earlier before we started church about the Bible saying in the last days men shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears and how in this modern age there are preachers out there who are virtually saying nothing. Nothing. They're not preaching anything at all of substance. But they're filling churches. They're filling churches like you wouldn't believe. I'm not trying to be mean. I know some of y'all are big fans of Joel Olstein, But honey, I, I knew Joel Olstein's dad. I shared some videos on Wednesday night some time back yep. of Joel Olstein's dad. I'm going to tell you something, John Osteen, hallelujah, that man was a Holy Ghost filled, on fire for God, tongue talking, spirit filled man. And he preached a wonderful message, didn't he? Yep. Oh, but he only built a church that had 5,000 members. Poor John Osteen. Boy, what I wouldn't do to have 5,000 people here today. Oh, but he dies and his son takes over. All of a sudden, you go to their website and you look up their statement of faith. Their statement of faith don't say nothing. You don't hardly know what they believe. You don't know what, you honestly don't know what that church even believes. It says nothing. You listen to him preach and it's all focused on this life and this world, it's all focused on, oh, God can help you to have your best. God can help you to be your best. God can help you. God can help you. Oh, God, help me. God don't need to help me. He saved me. God don't need to help me. He went to the cross for me. God don't need to help me. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. I'm all about what can I do for God. Hallelujah. I'm focused on living for Him. I'm not looking for Him to live for me. 
My God, he said, if any man will follow after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. God ain't asking you to leap, baby. He's asking you to follow. But we got preachers preaching a message, Johnny. They don't say nothing. They don't say, I went to an affirming church years ago. I'm going to be real careful because there might be somebody watching and I seriously don't want, I don't want to offend, but at the same time, I, I don't want to push anybody away by saying something that would hurt their feelings. I want them to feel comfortable listening to our messages. I won't tell you where it was, but it was part of New York City. An affirming so-called, so-called affirming spirit-filled church. And Jason and I went and visited this church one Sunday. And they had their worship service, and it was nice, you know. They sang songs I recognized, and they had a choir, and oh, everything seemed nice. And then the preacher got up to preach. And I'm not kidding, folks. I, I cannot explain to you how serious I am. What I'm about to say is literal. This is not figurative. This is literal. The man got up in the pulpit and he began to say a bunch of lines that were disconnected and disjointed and meant nothing. Literally, folks. I'm not kidding. Literally. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. He got up in the pulpit and it basically it was on this line. Milk is white. The sun is hot. Wind blows and your hair tussles. The clock moves with time. Lights come on when you flip the switch. I'm not kidding. This is exactly what I was hearing. Exactly what I was hearing. Jason looked at me. I looked at him. All of a sudden, I felt this demonic oppression come over me that was so powerful. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, Now look at the congregation. And the people in the congregation were up on their feet shouting, Yes! Hallelujah! Oh yes! Praise the Lord! Oh glory! And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this man. He literally was just saying lines i'm not kidding they weren't even spiritual they weren't they were just disconnected sentences that said literally people literally he was literally up there standing there saying nothing but the people were shouting and carrying on jason looked at me i looked at him he said should we leave i said as fast as we can <laughs> we got up and we darted out of that building as fast as we could but you want to know what's funny Lisa that church is still there they got lots of people every Sunday oh they fill that place up even when you think you've won because in the natural it looks good in the natural, it looks right. See, there are too many people in this country and in our church today who think that because these TV preachers have big audiences, oh, that must be evidence that they're winning, that they're doing things right, that they're saying what needs to be said and they're doing what needs to be done. That must be evidence that God is blessing them. No, not in the least. The Word of God said many are called, but few are chosen. The Bible tells us that the righteous will never, ever, ever be the majority. Never be the majority. It will always be the minority. Those who do right and who act right and who preach right and who teach right are never going to be the ones in control and in charge. It don't work that way. That's the word of God. That, that isn't Pastor Charles. That's the word of God. It tells us this. But we have people who judge things by what they see in the natural. And if it looks in the natural like they're winning, 
then we see them as conquerors. We see them as the people that we need to hold up and we need to hold in high esteem and we need to aspire to be like. Brother Gillum, my mentor in ministry many years ago, bless his soul. Brother Gillum pastored at best an average sized church. He had probably between two and 300 people. It's a good, you know, it's a good number of people, but it's, in today's world, you know, that's nothing compared to these mega churches. Oh, but I'm going to tell you something, Brother Gillum preached it straight and true. Brother Gillum preached it right. He believed in the move of God. He believed in the power of the cross. He believed in the power of the Holy Ghost. He believed in letting the Holy Ghost have his way in church services. Oh, honey, I saw Baptist preachers' wives visit our church with one of our church members because she, the lady in our church used to clean houses for a living. Well, one of the houses she cleaned was for a Southern Baptist preacher's wife and, and the preacher. Well, she used to tell this lady, well, if you ever want to, we'd love to have you come visit our church. Well, one day, this Baptist preacher's wife decided, yeah, I believe I'll go with you to your church and visit your church. I think it was on a might have been a Wednesday night because, you know, they had their services and all at her church. She'd come to our church, Brother Gillum's church. We began to have church. We began to worship. We began to pray. The Spirit of God began to move. People began to shout and dance and get happy. Oh, I mean, that church come to life, baby. We had a move of God. It was wonderful. Every time you walked out of God's house, you felt like you'd just been washed. You felt like you'd just been cleansed. You felt like you had just had this refreshing flow poured over you. You left church feeling so good, my God, all week long you were walking on a high because you felt so good leaving that little Pentecostal church with not but a couple hundred people. You know what happened to that poor Baptist preacher's wife? The one, that poor thing? She received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and started speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance right there in Brother Gilm's little church. Had to go home from church and tell her husband, who believes this is the devil, yeah. I received the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I received the baptism of the Holy That little lady's so excited she didn't know what to do with herself. Her husband was mad as a hornet. Oh my God, was he mad. About two weeks later, he finally got up the nerve and decided, I'm going to go check that church out for myself and see how they brainwashed and see how they tricked my wife into this foolishness. Let me see what's going on. So he came. <laughs> Guess what happened? He got the Holy Ghost. He spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave him the utterance. All of a sudden, the Southern Baptist preacher and his wife were no longer Southern Baptists. Now, they're Holy Ghost-filled Pentecostal people. Hallelujah to God. All because of a little church that knows how to let God be God. Oh, but if you ask a lot of Christians in the world, Brother Gilm's church wasn't nothing. Well, no, I, I go to Brother T.D. Uh, 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 Jake's church. T.D. Jake's, yes, there's where God is moving. There's where the blessing of God is. There's where the approval of God is. Look at how many people he has. Look at how many television cameras he has. Even when you think you're winning, you're losing. But God's called us to be more than conquerors. So that even when we lose, we're winning. Hallelujah. A parent today who loves their child does not stop loving them when they have failed miserably or done something illegal or unlawful. A mother whose son goes to prison for murder only feels greater love and compassion for her son, doesn't she? I have a family member who's experienced that very thing. One of my cousins, he and his wife had divorced and they had children and 
uh, he got drunk, to make a long story short, and one day uh, she did something that really enraged him and upset him. And long story short, he wound up killing his ex-wife. Even today, my cousin is in a penitentiary serving a life sentence. His mother was not a Christian, never had been a Christian her entire life. All the time she was married to my uncle, I never knew them to go to church. I never knew them to be interested in church. But when her husband, when her son went to prison, Lisa, she didn't stop loving her son because he murdered his ex-wife. She didn't stop having compassion on her son because he murdered his ex-wife. I got news for you, children. God don't stop loving you because of circumstance. God don't stop loving you because of situations. God doesn't stop loving you because you do something stupid or you do something unlawful or you do something you ought not to have done. No, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing, nothing. Isn't that what we read today? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Even when you lose, you win. Because you ain't going to get away from His love no matter how you slice it. But you want to know what's amazing about God? My cousin went to prison. While he was in prison, he found Jesus. Guess who else is now serving the Lord? My aunt. Hallelujah. Guess who else is now in the kingdom of God? My aunt is in the kingdom of God. Oh, the devil thought he won when that boy killed his ex-wife. He didn't win. No, 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 no. It looked like the devil won, but he lost. Hallelujah. Because God took that circumstance and made it into something positive and something wonderful. God could have taken Roe versus Wade and turned it into something wonderful and something positive if the church would have stayed on track. Now, I personally support and agree with gay marriage. I don't see a problem in the world with it. And I'm not going to stand up here and apologize for saying that. Y'all know how I feel. People want to devote their lives to one another. You can do it here. I'll happily do it for you. It's not a problem. But, but you know what? If you want to believe that, that gay marriage is the most evil, wicked, horrible thing on the planet, that's fine. Believe that all you want to. If you had a brain in your head and believed the Bible at all, then you would understand when gay marriage passed, there was an opportunity for what appeared to be a loss to be a win. No, problem is you were focused on the natural. You saw what appeared to be a loss in the natural, and you wanted to get a win in the natural. Instead of seeking a spiritual victory in spite of the natural loss. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And again, I don't want anybody to mistake what I'm saying. I don't believe that issue is the loss. That's how I, you know, I believe it's a win for everybody. But I'm just trying to give an example for those fundamentalists and other spiritually retarded people who are out there hearing what I might have to say. See, when you focus on the natural, Johnny, and you lose sight of the spiritual, then you're not living as more than a conqueror because you're trying to be a conqueror. But God has said, no, I haven't called you to be a conqueror. I've called you to be more than a conqueror. And when you're more than a conqueror, even when you lose, you win. Because God has a way of turning things around. God has a way of taking circumstances that were meant for evil and turning them to good. Am I telling the truth today? God's people are not called to fight culture wars and battles in this life and in this world. We are called to avoid them as much as possible, to walk in peace toward all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In the word of God, we are commanded, listen, to flee persecution. Oh, we've got these twit preachers out there. Oh, the church is being persecuted. We're being persecuted in America because these faggots want us to bake a cake for them. Really? And how many of you have gone to jail because you were asked to bake a cake for queers. How many of you lost your heads 
because you were asked to make a cake for gay people. Do you follow what I'm saying? See, let me tell you, the church today, at least the evangelical and fundamentalist church, they got more pansies in their church than we got in ours, trust me. <laughs> you talk about a bunch of weak little sap, you know, saplings. Those people about the weakest minded things that ever walked the face of this earth. Oh, persecution, 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 persecution. You're so full of garbage. Honey, you hadn't even seen a fraction of what the early church saw. Those people had to face lions. And you cry and weep in your cereal. Because, well, they won't let us put a manger scene on the lawn at City Hall. Who cares? Put it on the lawn of your church, you idiot. That's the only place it needs to be anyhow. The church ought to be making the statement, not City Hall. My Lord, am I telling the truth? If I'm telling the truth, somebody say amen. amen. My Lord, have mercy. Our God today is not able to be separated from us by circumstance or situations. His love knows no boundaries. Those of us who have believed and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ have tapped into the spring of His grace. And the spring of grace is an artesian spring. You know what an artesian spring is? That means it flows swiftly. It flows plentifully. And it flows endlessly. Hallelujah. It doesn't just show up and disappear at times. It doesn't show up when you need it and go away when you don't. No, 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 no. Grace is always there. It's there. It's there. It's there. It's there. It's there. When you fall, it's there. When you walk in victory, it's there. When you sin, it's there. When you're strong, it's there. When you're weak, it's there. It doesn't go away because things are going good for you and show up when things are going bad. No, it is there all the time because, honey, you are nothing but a flesh and blood human being. And whether you like it or not, chances are you're going to need it at some point. So God just keeps it flowing. <laughs> he just keeps it available to us. God commanded us in His Word to flee persecution. Now this may seem to sound like God is saying retreat. And if He's telling us to retreat, then surely that means we've been defeated. But does it? When persecution arose against the church in the first century, the gospel of Jesus Christ did not suffer one bit, but rather it flourished because of the persecution. You see, the devil was trying to put the flames of the Holy Ghost, and he was trying to put the flames of the preaching of Calvary out. But that big dummy threw a bunch of grease on the fire, and he did not put the fire out. He caused the fire to spread. Hallelujah. When persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, then the people just began to obey the voice of God, and they began to flee. They began to stretch out and go to other places. Everywhere they went, they began to preach Jesus. And guess what happened? Revival came. Hallelujah. Well, but they lost. They weren't able to hold their ground in Jerusalem. That's what John Hagee would tell us. That's what Ron Parsley would tell us. Bless God, they should have stood there in Jerusalem and held their ground and fought for their right. Glory to God. They said, no, they'd have wound up dead. And the gospel would have died with them. Because God did not promise He would protect them and keep them when they were under persecution. He said, when you're persecuted, leave. But you don't like the persecution, you poor, you poor fundamentalist and evangelical Christians. And if you can't stand up under the weight of all the persecution you're under in America, oh dear God, then get out! We won't miss you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> when persecution arose against the church, the gospel did not suffer it flourished. Were it not for the believers fleeing persecution, 
the faith of Christianity may never have reached far beyond the boundaries of Palestine and the Middle East. Matthew 10, 16 through 23. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men. Now, isn't that funny? God didn't say, don't worry about men who would do you dirty. Don't worry about them. He said, I'm going to keep you, and bless God, you're going to win every battle, and you're going to win every war, and nobody's going to bother you or hurt you. That's not what he said. He said, Be beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Sounds to me like there's an awful lot of division and divisiveness going on. Are we seeing that in the world today like we've never seen it before in history? Yeah, we are. Verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now listen. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. Oh my Lord, Jesus didn't say stand and fight. He didn't say hold your ground, let's go. God will give you the victory. No, no. Because what appears a victory in the flesh may very well be your defeat. So God says what appears to be your defeat in the flesh may very well be your victory. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He said, so when persecution comes to you in this city, flee into another city. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Matthew 2, 13, And when they departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child, Jesus, and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Why did God instruct Mary and Joseph to flee into Egypt with the child Jesus because of Herod? Why did God do that? Why, God, if you're the God of John Hagee, if you're the God of Franklin Graham, why, you'd give us victory in the flesh. You'd give us victory in this world. You would strike old Herod dead so that Jesus didn't have to flee into Egypt. You understand what I'm telling you? But he didn't do that, did he? I got news for you, folks. Sometimes God needs Herod to be where Herod is to accomplish his will in one area. And therefore, the whole world don't revolve around you. So while the church wants to look at everything through carnal eyes, and while the church wants to try to determine what is victory and what is defeat, based on what they see in the natural and what they see in the flesh, they are completely losing sight of the bigger picture. What is God doing? What is God doing? Let me tell you, Franklin Graham don't care what God's doing. Uh, John Hagee doesn't care what God's doing. Rod Parsley doesn't care what God's doing. No, all they care about is that it looked like the church in America is winning the battles in America. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That's all they care about. They don't care about what God's doing. When uh, Obama was running for his second term, I said many, many times, I believe that God wants Obama where he is for a reason. I believe that God is using him for whatever reason he's using him, however he's using him. I said that I'm going to vote for him because that's the way God has instructed me to vote. 
didn't have anything to do with whether I liked him or I didn't like him, didn't have anything to do with whether I supported him or didn't support him. The bottom line is that that's what I felt in my spirit. God spoke to me and said, I said, no, he's there for a reason. He's doing exactly, and let me tell you, if he hadn't have showed up, honey, then all these demons whose masks have been torn off in the last two years, we would have never seen their true faces, would we have? No, we needed that poor black man to go into the White House to be tormented for eight years trying to do a job so that we could see that racism in America was a much bigger issue and a much bigger problem than we ever wanted to admit. God knows what he's doing. See, if you can't see the bigger picture. But now we've got people trying to tell us the very thing I said about Obama, they're trying to tell us about this guy. And yet, when I was saying it about Obama, oh, I was so wrong, and I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. Well, there's no way. No, God isn't using him. No, God didn't put him in there. No, God doesn't want him there. Oh, I had fundamentalists and, and right-wing friends who are just having strokes over what I had to say. Oh, but all of a sudden, they get... Now, isn't it funny? Obama married once, got the same wife now he had when he first married her. He's not on his third wife. He doesn't have a trail of hookers and whores behind him that are, he's been accused of messing around with. You know, he hasn't done all kind of people dirty in business and caused people to have to shut down their businesses and lose their livelihood. He doesn't have the track record that old Mr. Trump has. Oh, but somehow or another, when I said that God was trying to use Obama for a purpose and for a reason, I was out of my bloody mind. Oh, but this character... That same explanation works for him. No, folks, got news for you. Even when you lose, you win. But when you think you're winning, in fact, you're losing. And the church thinks they're winning today because of Mr. Trump. And what they don't realize, in eternity, they have lost millions of souls. And my God, hell is going to be hot for the leaders in the church who have led God's people astray and caused them to compromise the integrity of the church in the name of political power and influence. Amen. I'm sorry to talk so much political. I'm, honestly, I kid you not when I say that I don't enjoy it. I really don't. I, I wish I never had to open my mouth to say a word of this. Almost done today. I'm trying to quit. Many Christians today want to believe that God will give them victory in the world. And in this life over circumstances and situations which they do not like or they do not care to endure. Yet Paul says that none of these circumstances can serve as a barrier between our God and his redeemed children. He did not destroy Herod to protect the child Jesus, but rather he instructed Joseph and Mary to flee into Egypt out of Herod's jurisdiction and reach until such time as Herod was dead. Sometimes the Lord is using Herod on one end to accomplish his purpose in one area so he can... He can't remove Herod. But he can help us to find a safe place where Herod cannot hurt us. <laughs> Too many believers try today so hard to be conquerors, winners, in the eyes of men and in the eyes of the world and in the context of this life. But it is only when we obey the voice of God and we live His will that we become more than conquerors. You remember the story of Joseph? Sold into slavery by his brothers? Oh, he lost. Bless God. Circumstances said that God didn't love him anymore, right? Because when things don't go right, that means you're out of God's love. That means you're no longer within the reach of God's love. That's what the church would tell you today, folks. Joseph was sold into slavery. Loser! You must have done something wrong. You must have displeased God. Something had to happen that you shouldn't have been doing, Joseph, or else you wouldn't be in that jam. Because after all, we believers always win. We always win. Our brothers would have never been able to sell us into slavery if you were doing things the way God wanted you to do things wrong. 
Genesis 50, verse 20, Joseph said, But as for you, talking to his brothers, long after he had made a name for himself in Egypt and become a major figure in Egypt, he said, Ye fought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Joseph wound up being able to rescue his entire family, what was the beginnings of the entire nation of Israel. He was able to save their lives because he was sold into slavery. Looked like he lost, Martin. Looked like he had fallen out of favor with God. Looked like he was no longer within the auspices of God's love. But guess what? Even when you lose, you win. Hallelujah. Even when things look dark and dreary, even when things don't look like they're going your way, hey, hang in there, folks. You're on the winning track. Trust me. You're headed for victory. Trust me. Don't you sweat it. You are on the winning end. As long as you're part of the kingdom of God and you stay focused on spiritual things, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things shall be added unto you. Stay on track, because even when it looks like you're losing, you're winning. Philippians 3, 7 through 11, I'm trying to hurry. Paul writes, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dumb. That I may win Christ. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law. But that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul said I've lost everything. But I've gained so much more. Hallelujah. What appeared to be a loss, what appeared to be defeat, is that I didn't lose nothing. I won it all. Hallelujah. I didn't lose nothing. I got so much more. There's an old song we used to sing that said, I sure got the best of the trade. Hallelujah. What I gave Jesus compared to what Jesus gave back to me, honey, I got the best end of the bargain. Let me tell you right now. Too many Christians today want their cake and eat it too. They want not only the promise of heaven tomorrow, but they want a soft, cushy, carefree life in the here and now as well. We are not called to affect or to influence our world politically or socially. We are called to engage always in a spiritual pursuit. In so doing, we pave the way then for the Spirit of God through us to affect and influence that small corner of the world where we live. And when all believers do this, there are mighty, mighty changes made. Not by us, but by the Spirit of our God. Now you can understand my, my picture up there with my message today, which hasn't been there for the last 40 minutes. <laughs> got a forest fire a forest fire may today destroy thousands of acres of plush and beautiful lands all kinds of beautiful greenery beautiful trees flora fauna but in the years to come a far greater forest shall arise because the residue of that fire that destroyed that land enriches the soil and benefits it in such a way with nutrients that it gives birth to an even greater forest than existed to begin with. 
even when it looks like you've lost, you win. Because God's grace is always there. God's love is always there. As long as you stay spiritually, keep your, your perspective spiritual, honey, as long as you keep your faith intact, as long as you don't let the devil rob you of your faith, there is nothing in the world the devil can do to tear you away from the love of God. And church, as long as we stay focused on spiritual things, the devil can look like he's winning all he wants to. See, I'm not worried about Mr. Trump right now. I'm not worried about him. I'm, I'm concerned for people because I honestly believe we're headed for Nazi Germany 2018. And I'm not kidding. We already see what amounts to trains being loaded up with people and then being shipped off to camps so they can be packaged up like animals in cages, aren't we? I don't think it would be too long before LGBT people, we see this guy who stood there with a rainbow flag and LGBT for Trump, idiots. Tried to tell him, Johnny, tried to tell him, this man's not done one thing for LGBT people, not one single positive thing, nothing. Instead, he's turned the clock backwards, and we are swiftly sliding back into the 1940s and the 1930s. Not just in LGBT issues, but in issues of race, in issues of immigration, in, issue, in all kinds of issues. We're going backwards. I'm not afraid of it, though. See, even though it looks like we lost, God can turn this into a win, folks. God can turn this into a win. So I'm not worried about defeating him, or I'm not worried about defeating his agenda. I'm worried about doing the work of the kingdom and staying focused and staying in the love of God and walking in the love of God so that God can use us to build a bigger and better forest than the one that existed before the fire. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen. Amen.